Well, good afternoon from Arlington, Virginia. Like you and your respective homes, I am in lockdown as we collectively endure the hardships imposed by COVID-19. I'm honored to address a virtual 29th Canadian Conference on HIV AIDS Research. And I would want to thank, thank the Canadian Association for HIV Research for your kind invitation for me to address HIV epidemic control. I uh, have to confess that it was difficult to wrap my mind around how we will resume our important work around epidemic control. That is until I started speaking to our clinician colleagues in cities around the world who are striving to maintain continuity of HIV care at the same time that their communities are responding to COVID-19. 60% of the clinician members we have surveyed worldwide, including in Canada, are managing COVID-19 in their practices. I applaud them and you for your heroism and dedication to duty. And large percentages of them are also concerned about HIV service disruptions, which we are trying to mitigate in the global north, as well as the global south. But on my talk, which is entitled 90-90-90 in the trajectory towards HIV epidemic control, which I will plan to base both on our experiences with the Global Fast Track Cities Initiative, but also some work we've engaged with UNAIDS regarding HIV epidemic control. First, I'll go through today's learning objectives, which are to recognize the 90-90-90 targets as a catalyst for data-driven responses, to identify best practices in closing gaps across the HIV care continuum, to define HIV epidemic control using metrics that complement existing indicators, and to describe the role of PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis as an adjunct to treatment as prevention or task to achieve HIV epidemic control. I will lead off with the UNA's 90-90-90 targets as a catalyst for data-driven responses. In 2014, UNA's proposed a very ambitious set of programmatic targets to end the HIV epidemic. The targets leveraged the concept of treatment as prevention, which is really pioneered by uh, good friends, including my, my friend from Vancouver, Dr. Julio Montana. The concept of treatment as prevention, aiming to place countries and municipalities on trajectories towards achieving HIV epidemic control by 2020 and ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. At the same time, UNAIDS noted that although many strategies would be needed to end the epidemic, one thing was certain, and that was that it was only possible in a scenario of universal test and treat. So why 90-90-90? The targets of 90% diagnosed, 90% on treatment, and 90% virally suppressed were based on mathematical modeling, which showed that when this, this three-part target was achieved, at least 73% of all people living with HIV globally would be virally suppressed. Further, the modeling suggested that achieving these targets by 2020 would put the world on a trajectory towards ending the HIV epidemic by 2030. Of course, it also made sure to stress the fact that only getting 73% of people living with HIV virally suppressed was not adequate. We needed to surpass the targets in order to achieve an end to HIV epidemics. Looking at what lies behind the 90-90-90 targets in a bit more detail, mathematical modeling predicted universal test and treat plus immediate initiation of antiretroviral therapy and HIV combination prevention could eliminate HIV transmission. In support of the crucial role of prevention and in the epidemic, UN member states, donors, civil society organizations, and implementers formed the Global HIV Prevention Coalition with the aim of delivering prevention services at scale to achieve the prevention targets of the 2016 Political Declaration on Ending AIDS, including a 75% reduction in HIV infections towards fewer than 500,000. Let's now move from modeling to what the real world tells us in the context of HIV treatment. So universal voluntary HIV counseling and testing, followed by prompt initiation of antiretroviral therapy for all those diagnosed infected is now the global health standard. However, its population level impact, feasibility and cost initially were unknown. So commencing in 2012, community-based trials enrolled more than 1.5 million people in East and Southern Africa to measure the effects of various universal test and treat strategies on reducing population level HIV incidence. Here we report on four of these trials, the Botswana Combination Prevention Project or BCCP, Pop Art in South Africa and Zambia, 
search in Uganda and Kenya, and NRS test trial in South Africa. If we look at these uh, trials, looking at the first 90, all four trials achieved the goal of greater than 90% of people living with HIV tested and knowing their status. Three of the trials achieved the second 90 of linkage to care and treatment initiation. And a key lesson learned from the task trial in South Africa, in which the second 90 was not achieved, was that the, the community HIV care providers in the intervention did not address a critical barrier in this setting, namely a very long delay between HIV diagnosis and ART initiation, particularly for men. Finally, all the trials achieved close to 90% viral load suppression or the third 90. Turning now from modeling to world, real world data in the context of HIV prevention, the landmark HTPTN052 study demonstrated 96% efficacy in reducing sexual HIV transmission among serous discordant couples when the HIV positive partner was on effective antiviral therapy and achieved viral suppression. This and subsequent studies have led to the worldwide U equals U or undetectable equals untranspittable movement one that IAPEC is busy supporting to ensure that clinicians integrated into their clinical practice is both a way of destigmatizing an HIV diagnosis, but also promoting the importance of adherence to antiviral therapy. Of course, there are other pivotal HIV prevention studies that bear noting, including PARTNER, PARTNER2, as well as Opposites Attract, which all indicated zero link trans sexual transmission between serodiscordant couples when the HIV positive partner had an undetectable viral load. In all, there were zero linked sexual transmissions after more than 100,000 condomless sex acts. While the 1990 targets globally will not be met by end of 2020, several countries and municipalities around the world have attained one or more of the targets. However, success in achieving ep epidemic control requires more than just reaching the 90-90-90 targets. It requires advocacy and political commitment, adequate financing, normative technical guidance, and research and development. Here we see the example of Kenya, as well as Nairobi City County. In Kenya, we see a significant increase across the 390s in relation to uh, people living with HIV who are diagnosed, people diagnosed on ART and, and those virally suppressed from baseline in 2014 through to current year 2018. If we look at the city data, here too we're seeing significant increases across the 390 from the baseline of 2014 when Nairobi City County became a fast track city and 2018 the latest date they reported their data. The fast track city's brand is being leveraged incidentally by cities around the world to accelerate their local age responses to attain and surpass the 90-90-90 targets. It should be noted that several cities have attained 90-90-90 and only one city in the world has the distinction of reaching 95-95-95, which was the city of London. In 2018, it announced that it had reached 95% of people living with HIV knowing their status, 98% of people who know their status on ART, and 97% achieving viral suppression. What is the calculus of success? So I'll spend a few minutes speaking to this because we've been looking specifically at what's moving the needles in both countries and municipalities, moving the needle of success. So first of all, we need the combination of political will and commitment, community engagement and public health leadership if we are to achieve HIV epidemic control. Responses must be data-driven and equity-based. Not knowing one's epidemic does not allow us to make the type of equity-based decisions and data-driven data decisions that are required to maximize the capacity of our health systems and optimize the HIV care continuum. As important, stigma and discrimination still represent significant barriers to accessing and utilizing HIV services, so they must be eliminated wherever they surface, including within health systems, where shamefully that still occurs. And of course, continuous quality improvement must also be at the center of the response, driven by ongoing assessments of quality of life, because we don't want to look at people living with HIV with, through the lens of laboratory values and negate the everyday real life and whole health issues affecting these patients. Finally, we need to listen and learn from each other through the sharing of best practices. In Canada, in the United States, 
as in Botswana, South Africa, Bank in Thailand, there are rich lessons to be learned that we can apply within all of our re uh, respective jurisdictions. Going back to this fast track cities experience, I want to, to relate uh, the importance of political will, commitment, and engagement, which cannot be overstated. As leaders in cities, elected officials such as mayors can play a key role in galvanizing efforts to achieve HIV epidemic control. Here are some quotes from mayors of select fast track cities in the African, European, Caribbean, and Asia Pacific regions, all indicating their willingness and their acceptance of the responsibility to exercise not just political will, but ongoing commitment to the objectives and targets in the Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities, which calls for cities to look at 90-90-90 as a starting point on the trajectory towards epidemic control and ultimately getting to zero new HIV infections, zero AIDS-related deaths, and zero stigma. The Fast Track Cities Initiative in large measure provides a framework under which governors can guide your urban HIV response. The Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities, as I already noted, focuses efforts on all people who are vulnerable to HIV and other diseases, and it helps to realize the human right to health for all affected people and communities. This includes, for example, the city of Montreal, which became a fast track city in 2016 and has made tremendous progress since then in trying to attain and surpass the 90-90-90 targets. We've seen this type of sustained commitment and engagement driving upward trends in the 90-90-90 targets while reducing stigma and discrimination, which I'll get into later in the presentation. Moreover, the meaningful engagement of affected communities is an important guide for policymaking, health finance planning, programming, service delivery, and accountability. The right to the city under the new urban health agenda is a concept that asserts that every one of us has a right to shape and operationalize an urban rights-based agenda within our respective cities and countries. Of course, I can't address the issue of HIV responses without speaking to the importance of not just national finance, but also municipal finance, where we find that the rubber meets the road. Financing health at the municipal level is extraordinarily complicated though. In some countries, cities cannot retain the GDP that generates from their own use. Budget constraints resulting from economic downturns, including the current COVID-19 uh, situation, can also thwart efforts to implement and gaps in health financing data affect effective, efficient decision-making. And so other key factors uh, for us in promoting the work of the Fast Track Cities and accelerating local HIV responses is again, the political engagement at all levels of jurisdictional authority, inclusive well beyond the city, a provincial and national level. Community accountability and ensuring the community are aware of what the 90-90-90 and other programmatic targets mean so that they can hold their elected officials, their public health officials, their clinicians, service providers, and even their own communities accountable for progress or lack thereof. Going beyond clinical care to supportive services, we need to look at housing, transportation, and food. Indeed, the expansion of government benefits for low-income residents, including the homeless and migrants, is a hallmark of successful HIV responses. And finally, while a data-driven urban HIV response is key to success in ending HIV epidemics, health systems themselves need to be capacitated to implement effectively. Here we see some of the activities that IAPEC is engaged in to support cities in their efforts to achieve HIV epidemic control. Thankfully, we did not advance these activities alone. We have myriad partners at community level, at clinical level, at, within academia, within government that allow us to implement but as important, we're engaged in the technical guidance on strategies such as self-testing uh, through regional workshops, conferences that allow us to look well beyond HIV and meet the objectives and targets of the Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities, which call on cities to look beyond HIV to include comorbidities such as hepatitis C virus infection, tuberculosis, as well as endemic conditions such as mental health and substance use, and of course, the key role that cities play in improving the overall quality of life for their citizens 
including for an aging population of people living with HIV AIDS. So the second part of my talk is really focused on best or good practices and closing gaps across the HIV care continuum. And again, it's based in large measure on our experience with the network of more than 300 fast track cities in the world. I've selected a few examples from cities and municipalities that we once deemed had intractable local HIV epidemics, but where we have seen remarkable 90-90-90 progress and are now documenting and validating best practices. I'll start with Bangkok metropolitan area. Uh, and here, this slide features 90-90-90 data from the city, depicting uh, data from 2014 in yellow through 2018 in dark gray. I think it bears noting that over the four year period since Bangkok metropolitan area became a fast track city, we saw a 26 percentage point improvement in the first 90, that is numbers of people or percentage of people living with HIV who know their status. And as important, a 21 percentage point increase in the second 90, people who are placed on antiviral therapy. With respect to viral load suppression of the third 90, this remains steady at 76% and is an area of programmatic focus. But for us beyond the data, we needed to understand what exactly was contributing to these improvements um, and where we could do perhaps more to address where uh, progress was lagging. The success in Bangkok was, was really spearheaded by programmatic prioritization for key populations with improved HIV and key population estimations to identify gaps, the initiation and support for health services delivered by key populations for key populations, the rapid rollout of targeted PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis for key populations, initiation of same day ART with outreach to key populations and the scaling up of health system wide stigma reduction that focused on the fact that key populations are the most vulnerable and stigmatized within the Thai society. None of this, of course, could happen without resource allocation. And here, critical was increased domestic funding for key population-led organizations, a budget to provide antiviral therapy to undocumented migrants and non-Thai residents, and political advocacy using the 9990 target data to maintain political will, even through times of political uncertainty or financial restrictions. Another example of a city in which we are documenting and validating best practices is the Kyiv city state in the Ukraine. The 90-90-90 trend data shown here is from 2015 through to 2018 with a 22 percentage point improvement in the first 90, a 29 percentage point improvement in the second 90, and an 11 percentage point improvement in the third 90 over the three year period. So what contributed to the success in Kyiv, as in Bangkok, success was driven in this city by programmatic prioritization with an approved 2017 to 2021 set of targets, decentralization of HIV testing and antiretroviral therapy delivery, the mobilization of significant public-private partnerships, the rollout of PrEP as part of combination HIV prevention for key populations, and the launch of a very robust and ambitious national strategy uh, for testing that ran, runs from 2019 through to 2030. Of course, in terms of political advocacy, there was sustained political commitment from the mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko and his deputy mayor, who would not have been expected to, to stake their political chits on uh, an HIV response, much less addressing the needs of key populations that had been highly stigmatized within Ukrainian society. But here, these mayors work closely to mobilize the community and forge intersectoral inter partnerships that have been key to expanding access to and utilization of HIV services, particularly by key populations, including people who inject drugs. This, of course, has led to a meaningful representation from communities and, as important, their active leadership. So, with the deputy mayor of Kyiv, and the executive director of a local HIV uh, service organization who is herself HIV positive, serving as co-chairs of Fast Track Kyiv. Finally, in relation to the three Fast Track cities that I'm profiling in this talk, 
Here we can see the 9990 trend data for Nairobi County and Kenya. I showed this earlier, but I'll break it down here. Over a two year period from 2017 to 2018, we saw in relation to the first 290s, a modest but steady improvement, but a significant 37 percentage point increase with regard to the third 90 or the percent of people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy who achieve viral suppression. Curious to know why, we looked at what exactly Nairobi County had done since becoming a fast track city that refocused their HIV care and prevention priorities to meet the needs of different populations that had been discounted for years. They rolled out and scaled up PrEP and HIV self-testing, used granulated HIV MTB data generated at the facility level, and they improved on an EMR system for better data management. As important, other keys to Nairobi County's success were included the leveraging of data to secure increased funding, including from the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief Program, or PEPFAR, the use of data to garner increased political support among parliamentarians nationally, working towards better retention outcomes, as well as stigma reduction amongst the general population, uh, not just health services, and then finally, the mapping of stakeholders to delineated roles throughout the county, including notably communities of people living with and affected by HIV and AIDS. A work in progress at IAPAC in relation to fast track cities, but a, a work that will expand to fast track countries as well as we recruit a significant or critical mass of cities within certain countries is the creation of a best practice repository, which is designed to share best practices and lessons learned in fast track cities and ultimately fast track countries. Some examples are shown here, and I, I wanna briefly speak to a few of them from New York City, Paris, and San Francisco. With respect to New York, the concept of HIV status neutrality is one that looks at the care continuum from a multi-directional versus linear perspective. Uh, it incorporates people living with HIV and those who are at risk, proposing the same approach for engagement uh, regarding, regardless of their status, uh, and has created an impetus for reducing stigma within, within the, the city of New York in its response to HIV, but also significant increase in utilization of HIV services that is being currently documented and will be shared at our Fast Track Cities 2020 conference later this year in Lisbon, should we be allowed to congregate again um, this year. Looking at Paris, we have a, a program that is strengthening the capabilities of African and Caribbean migrant communities to address HIV through their community-based organizations. It bears noting that in the city of Paris, 40% of new infections are among people from of, from Africa, primarily West Africa, as well as the Caribbean. And so this is a program that's fairly new within the construct of, of Paris and it's a, uh, towards an AIDS-free Paris strategy, but reflects the importance of addressing need based on data and equity. And finally, in San Francisco, I'd highlight two examples of best uh, or good practices. One is, is of collective impact, which is not a, a new notion within healthcare uh, or even public health as a whole, but it's commitment of a group of people from different sectors to a common agenda to solve a specific problem. In this case, San Francisco developed a common agenda. They developed common progress measures. They mutually uh, reinforced each other's activities across the various partners, including the Department of Public Health, community-based organizations, clinical providers, and as important elected officials, and created a uh, communication strategy that allowed for San Francisco to communicate, not just its successes, but also the various challenges that it faces in trying to close the gaps across the HIV care and prevention continuum. I'll now turn our attention to the topic of HIV epidemic control, which is what I was asked to address within the context of 9090 as a starting point. And here, you know, I'll speak to the issue of a definition for epidemic control and both current and proposed metrics that may complement 
the existing indicators that are globally agreed to. So defining it, epidemic control has been an incredible challenge, one that we had not anticipated because there is no single definition that's accepted by the key global or even national stakeholders. TEPFAR, the program I referred to earlier, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief in the US simply defines epidemic control as the point at which new infections have decreased and fall below the number of deaths among people living with HIV. Put another way, it means that the basic reproductive number, which measures the transmission potential of a disease is less than one. In 2017, uh, UNAIDS convened a scientific advisory board, which I was honored to, to, uh, to join, to meet in Lyon, Switzerland and build consensus around a definition of HIV epidemic control, which is also called epidemic transition by UNAIDS. Rather than a simple definition um, used by PEPFAR, the advisory board sought a definition which recognized the heterogeneity of the HIV response in terms of age, gender, geography, and key populations. We also recognize the importance of any definition, not just measuring the endpoint of control, but measuring the trajectory towards the endpoint and course correcting. Existing metrics for epidemic control include incidence rate per 100,000 uninfected people, which is a sustainable development goal 3.3 indicator, as well as age-related mortality per 1,000 population. Other existing metrics are the percentage reduction in new HIV infections or AIDS-related deaths compared to 2010, which UNAIDS considers the baseline. New metrics we talked about at the Glion meeting included the ratio of incidence to prevalence and the ratio of incidence to mortality, though I confess that the consensus around these metrics could be described as soft, and regrettably not much work has occurred since that initial meeting, uh, largely as a result of significant transitions within the global health uh, architecture, but also of course, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I also wanna note that in addition to defining epidemic control, both the advisory board that met in Clion and a UNA second world advisory group have called for improved metrics for HIV stigma and discrimination to be included within the overall metric for epidemic control. Here, we fully recognize the stigma represents as serious a public health threat as the virus itself, and that we must commit to its elimination through creating a metric for stigma elimination, um, but a metric that remains nonetheless elusive because it can be extremely difficult to quantify. Still, we're trying. So back to epidemic control from the issue of stigma, this slide speaks to work published uh, just this year in January by researchers from the Africa Health Research Institute who reported on trajectories towards epidemic control in rural KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. They followed about 23,000 HIV negative and 13,000 HIV positive participants to identify new infections and all cause-related AIDS-related deaths. They documented a reduction in new infections of 62% among men and 34% among women. And if we use the incidence mortality ratio metric, this fell from 4.1 to 3.1 in men and from 6.4 to 4.3 in women. But despite these impressive gains, the research concluded that overall progress was off track to meet the 2020 90 targets set by UNAIDS. I'd like to conclude my presentation by describing the critical role of PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis as an adjunct to treatment as prevention to achieve HIV epidemic control. It has been clear for us for quite some time that treatment alone was not going to end the HIV epidemic and that the paradigm for use of antiretroviral therapy had shifted with the convergence of treatment and prevention. In fact, eight years ago, IAPAC convened an advisory panel co-chaired by Julio Montana from Vancouver and Ken Mayer from Boston to look at precisely where we stood in relation to treatment and prevention and its ability to control the HIV epidemic. And at that time, we stated that together, treatment and prevention and PrEP can curb the HIV epidemic 
and that by integrating these two biobehavioral interventions, we could bend HIV incidence and AIDS-related mortality curves. But a UNH report, very recent one, bore out the result of failing to integrate treatments prevention and PrEP in the way that we and others had advised. And even in this era of treatments prevention and high levels of ART coverage, largely due to significant investments in the Global South by PEPFAR as well as the Global Fund, we're seeing that the estimated reductions in new HIV infections are significantly off target to meet the 2020 goals. If we saw earlier in KwaZulu-Natal data, the trajectory in the real world is also not on track. So whether we're modeling or looking at HIV responses in the real world, we're way off track in relation to reducing the numbers of new HIV infections, which requires a refocusing on an order that uh, we've, we've called now for quite a number of years and needs to occur if we are to meet the objectives of ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. But I'd like to share two success stories from the world of PrEP rollout that I think will inspire us uh, to, to further integrate not just PrEP, but overall combination HIV prevention um, in a way that makes more sense and can strategically get us to where we need to go. The first is in the UK, um, where PrEP has been available since 2017, but only as part of the IMPACT trial, which enrolled around 20,000 participants. And while they recognize the importance of treatment prevention, the scale up of PrEP is believed to have contributed to a 71% decline in new HIV infections among gay men and other MSM in the United Kingdom. In the Australian state of New South Wales, the EPIC New South Wales cohort also enrolled um, a much smaller cohort of, of patients, 3,700 people who commenced PrEP in 2017. The targeted and rapid rollout of PrEP in New South Wales led to a 35% decline in statewide HIV diagnosis amongst men who have sex with men to levels that are frankly unprecedented since the beginning of the HIV epidemic. This was achieved in less than one year after the target recruitment was reached. And in this concentrated epidemic with high testing and treatment coverage, PrEP scale-up has clearly led to a rapid decline in HIV transmission at the population level as well. In closing my talk, I circle back to my opening comments. It's difficult for many of us to imagine at this very moment, a world in which we achieve HIV epidemic control within the context of a global COVID pandemic that's costing us so much in terms of lives lost and economies on the brink of failing. Yet imagine and action it we must because our work in ending the global HIV epidemic is far from over. I'd just like to leave you with a quote from Professor Yoplanga, one of my mentors without whom we would not be in the good place that we are in relation to epidemic control being well within our reach. In his inimitable Dutch way, Yop warned us not to be fooled and not to succumb to inertia, but to flex our imagination to spur action. We can together end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, but it requires our concentrated focus and strategic approach that will leave no one behind and ensure that we can live an AIDS-free generation in our lifetime. Thank you very much.